Good evening and welcome to the Mythical Ireland podcast. My name is Anthony Murphy and this is podcast number 10. Today, uh, on the date of recording, it is the 23rd of September. This is the autumn equinox, so it makes sense that I should uh, talk a little bit about the equinox and in particular asking the question, what did equinox mean to a Neolithic astronomer? Also in tonight's episode, the Drone Henge book, the book about the discovery of the great uh, Henge close to Newgrange, has gone to print and I'll have news about its availability. And in addition to that, a little bit about the uh, November lecture about the same subject in Princeton University in New Jersey. So tonight we're starting with the equinox and what did the equinox mean to a Neolithic astronomer? Well, astronomically, the equinox occurs when the sun crosses the celestial equator. The word equinox derives from the Latin for equal night and is said to be the time when night and day are of equal length. At the equinox, the sun rises due east and sets due west. However, none of that would have meant anything to Neolithic sky watchers. And that's because the only way to discern the equinoxes in the Neolithic was to mark the halfway point measured in days between summer solstice and winter solstice, or vice versa, between winter solstice and summer solstice. And so I should say at this point that these things don't cor correlate the moment of equinox, according to the astronomical definition, i.e. the uh, sun crossing the celestial equator, occurred at 8.50am this morning, 23rd of September 2019. However, today's day and night are not of equal length. That does not generally happen on exactly on the day of the equinox. And the halfway point between summer solstice, which was on 21st of June, and the winter solstice on the 22nd of December, actually occurred on the 21st of September, two days ago. Confused? Well, don't be. Let's make it simpler and consider only what could be seen and discerned by a new Stone Age astronomer. And I suppose the most important question is this. Why would equinox have been important 5,000 years ago? What most scholars and even astronomers neglect to consider in relation to supposed alignments to the equinox, sunrise and sunset, is the possibility that these alignments were also targeting something else, i.e. the moon. The moon's nodes, the two places where the moon's path crosses the ecliptic or the sun's imaginary path through the sky, are rotating or regressing westwards through the zodiac. When the lunar nodes correspond with the points where the sun would be located at the equinox, the lunar standstills occur. And if you feel that that's all going over your head, bear with me and I'll try and explain some of it. At Cairn T, at Loch Crewe, the Hags Cairn, Schlievenachalia, crowds gather twice annually at the vernal and autumnal equinoxes to watch the sun entering the cruciform chamber of the monument, where the sunlight reaches all the way to the rear wall of the end recess and lights up what appear to be solar emblems carved into a stone over 5,000 years ago. However, what if the ancients were also watching the moon? If the light of the full moon rising in the east illuminated the so-called equinox stone at the rear of the chamber in the same way as the sun does at the equinoxes, what might this tell us? It might tell us that the lunar nodes are close to, or even precisely at, the points in the sky where the sun crosses the celestial equator. And what does this mean? It means that there is a danger of eclipses. A full moon shining its light into the rear of Cairn T and illuminating the panel of art there is at risk of entering eclipse and turning blood red. Two weeks before or after this, the invisible or dark moon 
is in danger of covering the sun and causing a solar eclipse. Cairn T appears to be aligned so that the sunlight at dawn on the equinoxes lights up a stone at the rear of the chamber. But why would Neolithic astronomers mark this occurrence? Equinox is not a solar event in any meaningful sense that Stone Age astronomers could witness. They could not count the minutes or hours to determine equal day and night. They are unlikely to have been able to determine a celestial equator. The only two hooks or turning points of the year are the solstices, when the sun's rising position clearly halts and remains in the same position for several days before turning back in the opposite direction. There is no such visual indication of equinox, so why mark it with an alignment? And I think it's because they were watching both sun and moon. The moon's nodes rotate through the zodiac over a period of 18.6 years, or six synodic lunar months short of a 19-year metonic cycle. When the moon's nodes are at the sun's solstice points, there is a danger of eclipse occur eclipses occurring at the time of the solstices, with the potential for a rising eclipsed moon, for instance, to be seen from the chamber of Newgrange. When the moon's nodes are at the equinox points, as well as there being a danger of eclipses occurring at the equinoxes, something else definitely happens, the lunar standstills. That is when the moon's rising and setting positions occur far to the north of the sun's summer solstice, sun rising or setting positions, or far to the south of the sun's winter solstice rising and setting positions. Does that sound complicated? It might do, because modern astronomy textbooks do not teach us prehistoric lunar astronomy. And I have to add that as an astronomer since a very young age, I've studied and read many astronomical books and magazines and texts over the years. And I had to learn this aspect of, you know, observable uh, prehistoric lunar astronomy uh, without the aid of those texts. And it's helpful to remember that all of the things that I'm talking about are observable, as in the Neolithic stuff, the rotation of the nodes, the lunar standstills and the equinox as the halfway point between the solstices, not as the point where the sun crosses the celestial equator or even where the sun rises due east and sets due west. These are not things that are practical uh, when you're a, a community that is moving through the landscape. Over time, the ancient astronomers watched and observed, counted and recorded the movements of the moon. And then, according to their own predictions, they would have seen these cycles repeat themselves. Eclipses occur in predictable, observable sequences. The rotation of the nodes recurs every 18.6 years. The metonic cycle, although 19 years long, can be predicted after just a few years of observing the moon's movements. At the equinoxes, for years I have celebrated Cairn T at Slivnakalia La Cru as a wonderful achievement of Stone Age ingenuity. But not just because twice a year the sun illuminates the interior in dazzling fashion. It's much more complex than that. Cairn T is, in my opinion, evidence for a much more advanced astronomy than we give its builders credit for. Sadly, we can no longer witness the beautiful illumination of the chamber of Cairn T because it has been closed to public access. And this is something that I discussed in a previous uh, podcast. It was closed in October 2018 as the OPW investigated possible structural damage and has remained closed since then. Uh, and if you want to find out more about that, uh, you should go to mythicalireland.com. In other news, I'm delighted to report that after months of work, the book about the discovery of Drone Henge has been sent to the printer. Um, it... Today is the 23rd of September. All going well. The book will be available um, 
uh, uh, to, well, it's certainly available to pre-order right now, but I should have copies in my hand around the third or fourth week of October. I'm hoping uh, around the 21st of October. Um, it's been an interesting journey from the point of view of the writing because I um, I didn't give myself um, a huge amount of time. Uh, I began writing the book in April uh, of this year. Uh, so May, June, July, August, September, it's all been written and put together and designed and proofed and sent to print in the space of five months. I hope that the result is a a good reflection uh, of the discovery and the excitement around it, the build up to it, the aftermath of it and the second half of the book. Not that it's specifically divided into two sections as such. There are 11 chapters plus a, plus a prologue and an epilogue. Um, the second half of the book uh, deals with an interpretation of what it might have been uh, used for and tries to put it in context with some of the other discoveries in the Bruna Bonia landscape uh, made by myself and Ken Williams and the National Monument Service uh, and and uh, last summer and uh, other things that have been found in the meantime. So uh, what I propose to do uh, right now is to just read a few paragraphs from the prologue of the book, uh, which is called Dronehenge, the story behind the remarkable discovery at Newgrange. Um, a lot of people have been commenting about the name of the monument. The National Monument Service call it the Geometric Henge. Uh, another archaeologist suggested it should be called Site P1. Uh, Drone Henge is a title that was given to it within a couple of days of the discovery by some of the tabloid media. And it's a name that seems to have stuck. Uh, and I personally prefer it to the Geometric Henge. Uh, and certainly much prefer it to site P1, which is, uh, in my opinion, thoroughly lacking uh, any imagination. My preoccupation with the fate of Ireland's Stonehenge, this is a, a monument close to Dundalk that was destroyed sometime in the past two centuries, and its later re-emergence from the mists of prehistory, foreshadowed events which were to follow in the summer of 2018. Henges are not commonplace monuments, although there are concentrations of them in, our, in Ireland, particularly at Brunabonia. What was the likelihood that another enormous henge monument with extraordinary one-of-a-kind features lay hidden in the landscape much closer to home in the bend of the Boyne? one of the most scrutinised prehistoric landscapes on the face of the earth. If you had told me at any time before 10th of July 2018 that I would discover a monument close to Newgrange that would parallel Ireland's Stonehenge in terms of scale, age and fascinating features, I would have derided you for indulging in fantasy. No such monument could exist at Brunabonia, I would have said, because every significant monument and archaeological feature to be found in that relatively small area had been revealed by a variety of archaeologists and specialists using an array of technologies and techniques. Furthermore, nothing of that size could possibly have remained hidden from view for generations. That's what I would have said. And anyway, what useful contribution could a journalist, photographer and armchair archaeologist like myself make to the monumental landscape of Brunabonia? The greatest contributions were those of the professionals, the experts. Many of these people are friends and acquaintances of mine. I knew my place, or at least I thought I did. The events of Tuesday 10th of July 2018 changed everything. Fate and the universe conspired again, placing one of the greatest Irish archaeological discoveries of recent decades directly into my hands. Accompanied by my long-time friend, ceaseless archaeological researcher and eminently talented photographer Ken Williams, I stumbled upon the find of the century. 
What follows is my account of that fantastic discovery, the long build-up to it, and the excitement in the days and weeks afterwards that saw the details of its revelation relayed to millions of people around the world. This is the story of the long-lost monument now revealed to the world again that has been dubbed Dronehenge. And so I hope that suitably sets the tone for the book and I hope that you thoroughly enjoy it if you happen to uh, get your hands on a copy at some stage and have a read of it. have to be honest, it's different to everything I've written before in certain respects in that um, it, 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 you know, by necessity, it chronicles, um, you know, as I say, the build up to and the time of the discovery. And from that point of view, it's a rather factual presentation. Uh, but it's, I think, in the style of a sort of a uh, a, a documentary book, it, it, it attempts to capture some of the, the real excitement around that. And of course, the public excitement and reaction to it. Uh, and then uh, there's some interpretive work. I mean, I'm not qualified uh, to uh, necessarily discuss what what this monument might have looked like and and what were its uses. But but based upon um, the work of other archaeologists and uh, experts, I've tried to piece together uh, some ideas in terms of its functions. And I hope that that I've done I've done it justice in that regard and that you find it exciting. Uh, the good news is that it's going to be cheaper than my other uh, non-fiction works. It's going to retail at €19.95. Um, my other books were, were very expensive when they were brought out. Uh, Island of the Setting Sun and Mythical Ireland are both twenty nine ninety five, and Newgrange, I think, is currently retailing at twenty four ninety five. So this one's going to be a bit cheaper. I'm hoping to have a launch somewhere in Drogheda or close to my home place or somewhere in the Boyne Valley uh, in late October. Keep an eye on mythicalireland.com for news of that. Or if you're on Facebook, it's Facebook, facebook.com forward slash mythical Ireland. In addition to all of that, I'm going to the United States in November um, uh, to give a lecture at Princeton University about uh, Dronehenge and the discovery. Um, a while back, I was invited uh, by uh, Pulitzer Prize winning Irish poet uh, Paul Muldoon um, to to deliver this lecture. The date is the 22nd of November, Friday 22nd of November, which some of you will know is a very significant uh, date in Irish American history. The talk will be introduced by Paul Muldoon. The event is a free public lecture. Uh, I'm told there's no need to pre-book uh, uh, tickets. And I've already been told by a number of people um, that who I know either online or who I have met on tours here in Ireland that they're looking forward to seeing me there. And I can say likewise, it's very exciting for me. It's hopefully the beginning of a new adventure. So if you want to find out more about this mysterious 500 foot wide monument that managed to remain completely concealed in the landscape evading the uh, the attention and the and the eyes of generations of archaeologists um well if you want to hear more about it uh, and see some of the images and the video uh, come along to princeton of course if you're not in the united states and you're in ireland you may be more interested in attending uh, the book launch over here in the meantime i'd be very happy to have any of your questions and to try uh, to deal with uh, any uh, queries that you might have around the subjects covered tonight. I am hoping uh, in the near future to do a, a podcast uh, based solely on questions uh, from uh, Mythical Ireland listeners and followers. So if you want to send me those questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them, notwithstanding the fact that I'm not an academic ex expert in any of this. In the meantime, I also did a live podcast interview with Blind Boy of Rubber Bandits fame uh, in Drogheda uh, recently. Uh, now, the podcast hasn't been published yet, but but I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we had quite a lot of fun. He's a, he's a comedian and he's very funny. Um, it's, it'll be a little bit different to anything you've heard me um, um, doing before, uh, but I hope uh, equally you find it interesting. 
Again, just a reminder that the website is mythicalireland.com. Along the top, you'll see gallery and shop. And if you go in there and, and, and click on book or books, uh, you'll get into the books and you'll see there that the Dronehenge book is available. Uh, a signed copy is available for pre-order through the secure website. And I'd be very glad to send one in your direction uh, when I get them into my hands. Thank you very much. This has been the Mythical Ireland podcast. I'm Anthony Murphy. Talk to you soon.